Kiara, Auckland. I'm going to talk on the impact of Alfred Cobbin and his followers and successors and opponents on interpretations of the 1789 revolution. Alfred Cobbin was Professor of French History at University College London from 1953 to 1968. The image you can see is the only one we seem to have of him, but at least it is him in his mature years. He was the outstanding historian of France in Britain at the time. His first books were on Burke and then on Rousseau. He dedicated his Rousseau volume to his wife Muriel, a formidable lady who organised all real life so effortlessly that he could devote himself totally to writing, teaching and to trying to manage the study of history. For him, as for Mark Bloch, whom he admired, the historian could only understand the past in the context of the present. He was deeply concerned about the turbulence, violence and inhumanity of the world in which he had to live. He argued with force that society needed to return to past moral and ethical standards. He was committed to egalitarian social reform. He published a series of powerful and influential accounts of the contemporary world from, in 1939, dictatorship in theory and practice, to a history of Vichy France in Toynbee's Hitler's Europe in 1954. In 1949, he wrote a brief introduction in French, he rarely published in French, to a new edition of Dolion Le Chartisme. The first edition in 1949, for, sorry, 1914, had been introduced by Sidney Webb leading Fabian and founder of the London School of Economics. Cobbin was sympathetic to Fabian socialism, though not noisily so. Um, the most controversial of his 13 books and numerous articles were critical analysis of the research of leading scholars in French universities. He was an empiricist, disdaining abstract theory. Historical writing had to be based on archival evidence, but he abhorred mere academic magpie collecting of insignificant facts. Cobbins' most remembered and influential contribution to history was his interrogation of the social significance of the 1789 revolution. He claimed that French academic historians, led by Georges Lefebvre, believed that the revolution was made by and for the bourgeoisie in line with the Marxists claimed that this was the first stage in an inevitable historical process which would lead to a classless society. Sobol began his 1965 account of the revolution. La, revol la révolution marque l'avènement de la société bourgeoise et capitaliste dans l'histoire de la France. In his inaugural lecture as professor of French history in 1954, which he entitled The Myth of the French Revolution, attended by the French ambassador, and in his Bars lecture in 1962, and finally in Social Interpretation of the French Revolution, Cambridge 1964, Cobbin asserted that although the revolution radically changed France politically, her complex social structures were far more difficult to order. He questioned both contemporary sociological and especially Marxist theory concerning the revolution. He quoted detailed evidence from Lefebvre, Labrousse and Sobol that French society was extremely complex. He concluded that their own archival evidence and massively detailed research didn't support the more simplistic Marxist theories they later enunciated. Perhaps himself overlooking that historians tend to simplify when they write textbooks. Thanks Peter McPhee for pointing that out to me and I think he's probably right. Cobbin didn't deny that the third estate members elected to the Estates General in May 89 were predominantly bourgeois. Citing the earlier research of Lefebvre and the American historian George V. Taylor, Cobbin pointed out that these men were predominantly bureaucrats, state servants, professionals, especially lawyers, landowners, not capitalists. And that this had actually been Lefebvre's own conclusion in 89, which he published in 39. 
Lefebvre claimed, and Coburn agreed, that 89 was the consequence of long-term social conflict, but Coburn argued that social change was always the result of slow development, not revolution. Coburn had enormous respect for Lefebvre as the most recent of the greater historians of the French Revolution. He sent Lefebvre copies of his academic articles, which Lefebvre retained in his personal library, and they can be seen today in the collections on 1789 in the Chateau de Vizel. Common turned to the social consequences of the revolution. He noticed that in the summer of 89, the decision of the new National Assembly to abolish feudal law, seigneur of Jews and the tithe, was not a choice, a choice by bourgeois deputies, which Marxists had claimed. Many bourgeois had bought these rights, and as Lefebvre wrote himself, the bourgeoisie had neither the time nor the desire to attack the tithe or feudal rights. Abolition was dictated by peasant anti seigneurial insurrection, the Grand Peur of the summer of 89. And Lefebvre, in his own book, La Grand Peur, which Cobbin admired enormously, had also stressed the significance of peasant action. The abolition of seigneurial dues and the tithe after the night of the 4th of August may be seen as one of the main social consequences of 89, a victory of country people over the towns. Cobbin, while acknowledging that the more substantial peasants were victors, noticed, noted that feudal Jews actually survived for those who were tenants in higher rents. Cobbin went on to refute the Marxist claim that 89 led to capitalist growth. Indeed, the upheavals of revolution and 25 years of war retarded the French economy, which Jean Risset and Albert Sabal recognised. There was no sudden large-scale industrial takeoff in France during the next century. Nor did 89 lead to rapid social change, in part because the revolution had made peasant land tenure more secure and a nation of six million peasant landowners, something no other country in Europe had. Coburn also noted that nobles retained virtually the same proportion of land after as before the revolution, falling from around 25% to around 20%. But he didn't, of course, mention that they'd lost their seniority of rights. Social interpretation caused quite a stir, not least for a distinctly odd review in the Times Literary Supplement, Richard Cobb, nicely dealt with by Betty Berons in the uh, Historical Journal. Their favour and his colleagues found Cobbins' myth of 89 negative, but that didn't stop Mounier inviting Cobbin to give a paper in Paris a year after its publication. In 1974, ten years after Cobbins' lecture, when the dust had very much settled, Sabor summarised recent approaches to 89. He stressed 89 as a national, not a bourgeois revolution, and claimed that the traditional view of the significance of 89, begun by Guizot, carried on by Mathieu and Jaurès, etc., had been undermined in the 1950s. First by R. R. Palmer, who with God show, a Frenchman, argued that in the second half of the 18th century, the Western world had experienced an Atlantic revolution. Sobol observed that this interpretation lessened the significance of 89 as a French revolution. Cobbin, he said, went further, denying that 89 was anti-feudal and capitalist. However, Sobol did agree with Cobbin that capitalist structures develop very slowly in France. So in the end, their views are not massively different, but perhaps by 84 it didn't matter. Sobol cited Cobbin's publications in this article. Did he read them in English? I don't know. Very few of Cobbin's books were translated into French, though most exist in their English editions in the Bibliothèque Nationale Catalogue. A translation of social interpretation didn't appear until 1984, as Leçon de la Révolution Française, introduced by Professor Emmanuel Leroy Ladurie. The book received few reviews in France. Leroy Ladurie? An least star microhistorian, a communist until 56, by the 1980s was an anti-Soviet conservative. 
His introduction was his only published commentary on Cobham, as far as I could see. Sadly, Gallica has never digitised this volume, and Amazon France lost the copy I ordered. It was reprinted in Raymond Aron's conservative journal, Revue Commentaire, but this has proved tricky to access. Perhaps we can conclude La Relaterie may have thought Cobham's revisions modest, since he put them in inverted commas in his title, though without inverted commas in the four-page introduction. And Le Relaterie found school level, Marx's views of 89, too well known to discuss. That's as far as the web version allowed me to go. Cobham's only other book translated into French was the series of essays on 18th century Europe written for a general public, a lovely coffee table book. He edited it and contributed a chapter on music. We have to be aware that Cobham's challenge to contemporary views were actually part of a substantial rethinking of 89 in France at the time. Younger scholars undertook detailed analysis of local society, which radically modified Marxist broad analysis. Think about them. Agulon on the Var, 1972. Cobain on the Poor of the Limousin, 77. Goubert on the Beauvais and Le Relaturé himself on Landoc. Their thesis transformed social history in France, though. They were so long that I don't know how many people actually read them. The commemoration of 89 was then in the bicentenary was notable for an absence of peasants, workers or bourgeoisie. In the 1960s, François Furet and Denis Richet were the only historians in France who agreed with Cobbins' claim that 89 had a very limited social impact. Sobol was as contemptuous of their interpretation as he was of Cobham. Furo, quoting Cobham, denied 89 was primarily about social cleavage and class interests, but about challenges to political legitimacy. Like Cobham, Furet also claimed that in 89, peasants were less anti-aristocratic than anti-capitalist. Furet also challenged Marxist views on the bourgeois revolution and supported Cobham's contention that although bourgeois groups were committed to 89, few had links with capitalism. And for Furet, as for Cobham, we're talking about not one revolution, but a peasant revolution and a bourgeois revolution, a political revolution, creating representation, careers open to talent and so on. Furet also revived interest in de Tocqueville's interpretation that in political terms, 89 was less a dramatic break, but a continuation of attempts at institutional reform. Cobham also questioned Marx's theory on the inevitability of the replacement of noble by bourgeois power, noting that a new elite of notable, noble and bourgeois merged was making the idea of a straightforward bourgeois takeover um, uh, too simplistic. Cobham highlighted research being undertaken in France at the time. Think of André Jean, Jean Tudesque's study of the Notable, published in 1964. Uh, Chosin Nogeret, 1976, whose essay on the nobility, William Doyle translated into English nine years later. The theme was taken up by Doyle himself, by Cobham's student Don Mac uh, John McCrail in his thesis on the attack on feudalism, published in 73, and by David Higgs, whose nobles in 19th century France, 1987, stressed the persistence of noble power. Cobham's suggestion that office holders such as parliamentaire were critical of the crown because their offices were losing value, wasn't sustained by the later research of William Doyle, which he embarked on when he'd read Cobham's account. Doyle also expressed doubt over Cobham's suggestion that office holders made a profit during the revolution when they were compensated for losing their offices. Cobham didn't belittle the political importance of the revolution. It wasn't a myth in that sense to him. Or the need felt in 89 to make French society fairer and more equal. 
He noted the role of Enlightenment ideas in bringing about revolution, but was less concerned with the Enlightenment as a body of theory than its practical application. His Rousseau book in 34 and in 59, In Search of Humanity, The Role of the Enlightenment in Modern History. For Cobbin, Enlightenment authors were utilitarian reformers, French Benthams. What mattered was their commitment to humanity, their search for ethical standards. His book was less a detailed account of their ideas than of their long-term legacy and the way in which enlightened ideas were abandoned in the 20th century. Several of his British students followed him on this path, the most outstanding being Keith Baker, a much-honoured senior professor at Stanford, renowned for his work on Condorcet and the revolutionary content of philosophic ideas in 89. Cobbins' reputation as a historian owed much to his doctoral teaching, which was central to his work. His doctoral seminar met weekly at the Institute of Historical Research on Monday afternoons. Students contributed research on topics ranging from the wars of religion, aspects of Louis XIV's reign, to 1789, Georges Roudet, outstandingly, Nora Temple, Owen Houghton, and Clive Church, and in the 19th century, Aaron Collins, David Hicks, and myself. In the 1950s and 60s, Cobbin was the leading supervisor of French history of doctoral students in Britain, attracting students from Britain, including Oxford and Cambridge, but also from North America, particularly Canada. He was already known in North America from his visits to universities and conferences. He gave one of the eight papers at the first conference of the Society for Historical Studies in 19, French Historical Studies in 1958. His first Canadian students were John McLaughlin, John Boscher, Harvey Mitchell, and then following that came David Higgs, Tim Legoff, and Donald Sutherland. Donald Sutherland, multiple prize winner, is the author of the Fontana History of the French Revolution. And there we go. From the mid 1960s, historians became decreasingly convinced that economic factors were of prime importance in shaping society. Perhaps because society and the economy seemed quite comfortable at the time. Identity became paramount. Region, gender, religion, ethnicity, all a range of broader cultural issues such as language, education, leisure activities. I even wrote about waxworks. Microhistory was often preferred. The concept of revolution itself was questioned by Foucault and postmodernists, who rejected the notion that, notion that events have precise causes or results. While many historians were uncomfortable with the intellectual relativism of postmodernism, contingency and chance found favour again. The outbreak of revolution tends now to be explained more by chance and personal decisions or lack of them. Leading exponents are people like Doyle, and Timothy Tackett, who blamed the king for his ineptitude, indecision, and stubbornness in failing to reform absolutism. Peter McPhee and others in France elsewhere have focused on popular and regional issues. McPhee has analysed how rural and small town men and women adopt, adapt, and resist change from Paris. In his day, Cobbin was described as revisionist, but interpretations of 1789 moved with such speed that the term soon became quite out of date. McPhee now talks about minimalist when describing those who, while not challenging the enormous and long-term impact of the revolution on French institutions, continued to assert the slowness of French social change. Finally, what does revolution mean in France today? In the most recent series on the history of France, which apparently President Sarkozy urged the publishers Soy to produce to ensure French national history was never forgotten. The contemporary age no longer begins in 1789, but in 1799. The 1789 revolution is now an end, not a beginning. The aim, according to Le Monde, is to situate France in the modern world. The first volume, the Empire of the French makes 
almost no reference to 89. And even the personal role of Napoleon is downplayed. Subsequent volumes, volumes mute the significance of revolution, chronologically embracing both the revolutions of 1830 and 48. Volume 2 is called Monarchy Post Revolutionnaire. It blots the revolutions out. But revolutions aren't like white rabbits, they don't just disappear. Both of the post revolutionary monarchies fell prey to revolution. Volume 3 is called Le Crepuscule des Revolutions. Revolutions are certainly obscured in the dusk in that volume. Having lost their Marxist justification, the French seem puzzled to explain their own tendency for repeated revolution. The term civil war, used by Marx to describe the Paris Commune, has become a favoured description of what used to be called revolution. Insurgents tend now to be called blood brothers rather than revolutionaries. Revolutionaries now, revolutions now seem to be rather embarrassing accidents, devoid of analytical substance. The decline of the French Communist and Socialist parties in the Fifth Republic, for whom 1789 was central to their philosophy, may provide some clue. More recently, revolution has been discredited when the Arab Spring brought disastrous conflict not liberating change to the Middle East. But revolutions remain serious concerns in the present day, especially because the inequalities and widespread poverty that contributed to revolution in 1789 and have subsequently been intensified by the growing gap between rich and poor in the modern world. Thank you.